but I found that to try to hold on to too much of it and not to let it flow or make it work for you will make it stagnant. And it's sort of like my same philosophy in the garden. You have to keep things moving and flowing and growing or they won't. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Fi Show. But first, let me check in with my co-host, Justin. What's going on, man? Well, we just had the long weekend, Memorial Day weekend. I spent most of it just hanging out with family, getting outside, enjoying some of the nice weather. Also, cooking some good steaks. And if you're out there and like you don't have a grill, you don't have a lot of stuff, but you want to be able to cook a really good steak, I would highly recommend looking into sous vide cooking where you cook it in a water bath. It will be the best steak you ever had and you don't even need a grill. How about you, Cody? Well, I can definitely get behind the sous vide. I have not had your sous vide steak, Justin, but I did have your sous vide turkey, which was phenomenal. So this past weekend, I actually helped my girlfriend. She's moving out of her apartment in Western Mass and we're going to be moving together in Central Mass for the summer. So it was kind of a big undertaking, but we got everything done and everything's all set to go now. But before we dive into today's guest, let's take a quick pause for our partner. Keeping track of your net worth is one of the most important things you can do on your journey to financial independence. If you don't have an idea of what your net worth is, there's no way that you can keep your quote unquote score. One of our favorite tools to keep this score is called Personal Capital. If you haven't already started using it, it's an online software that basically compiles all of your data, it crunches all your assets, all your liabilities, and spits out a net worth number and allows you to track it day by day, month by month. Yeah, Cody, one of the big things that hold people back when they're doing activities like tracking their expenses or tracking their net worth is just they look at it as a big burden. And this allows you to go in with one username and one password and access as many financial accounts as you have. These can be loans. These can be 401ks. These can be HSAs, bank accounts, credit cards. They're all linked there. The other thing I really like about personal capital is it's very investing focused. So you can go in there and look at your allocation across your entire portfolio. So you don't just look at your allocation in one type of account, but your allocation as a person completely. And if you want to use the same tool that me and Cody use to track our net worth, which is completely free, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash PC. That's thefyshow.com slash PC. Today, we have a really unique episode, which I'm always excited about. I mean, I love the real estate guys, love the side hustles, but I also really love bringing a new guest who just have a different flavor than what you're used to hearing in the personal finance space. And Eddie and Sam definitely check those boxes. They're down in Hawaii and they're doing this thing called regenerative farming. And it's just really awesome to see how resourceful they are. And Eddie's been doing this and living off the land since he was like seven, which has to be the earliest FI number we've ever heard. But we don't want to take away all of his thunder. Take it away, Eddie. Sitting at the beach, talking with some old guy that lived at the beach, and he was on vacation, and a conversation came up with, what can I do? What do you do? What am I going to do? Oh, I like to surf. What do you do, kid? I surf all day. Well, how do you eat? Oh, I get to climb coconut trees, and I get to eat fish out of the ocean, and I get to eat pretty good here. He's all, well, you got people would pay hundreds of dollars an hour to be able to live that lifestyle. So that simple conversation sort of brought me to the idea of like, what do we define as wealth? And I think from a young age, in my mind, I got set up for the belief of there's two ways to wealth, acquire more or desire less in the sense of like what fulfills us. So that in that term of retiring, I met that I have everything that I need. So I'm going to pursue my dreams and I'm going to try to live this life rather than acquire a certain amount before I'm able to pursue my dreams. So maybe that's not like the most in depth of like how I actually did it. And I'll get into that, but I want to put, throw one other thought in there. At a young age, I kept hearing the story that in the development of humankind, there seems to be three stages. There's a uh, survival, a uh, security or whatever survival. Then there's acquirement, which is sort of like security. You got something. And then there's philanthropy sort of in the later stages. If you just broke it into those three stages, I realized that I could go surf all day and just the fact that I'd planted some seeds a couple weeks before in the morning and came home and watered them after I surfed that within a few weeks I'd be on the giving end of the stick with a wheelbarrow full of eggplant to take down to everybody at the beach. So that was sort of, I I jumped right into philanthropy. 
instantly at a real young age from that understanding and concept of what wealth meant to me. And Eddie, as a young child growing up and climbing these coconut trees, getting the fish out of the ocean, where are you learning these skills from? Is this something where you're kind of out on your own doing this? Did you have like a family set up around you who lived this lifestyle and passed that down to you? So my family passed that down to me already, always growing up in the islands and growing up around the ocean. I was just there with it next to me. I had coconut trees there. I had fish around me. But I sort of also was one of those kids who didn't stay at home very much. I didn't go to school. When I was supposed to be in school, I was out surfing all day. Or I was with a friend out fishing or diving or doing something different. So I sort of took it on my own and I wound up sort of living with my friends more so from a very early age than I did with my family. In Hawaii here, we have what's called a Hanai system where you're kind of adopted into the family. All the kids that surf together. Next thing you know, you're just over there at breakfast and lunch and dinner. So I lived pretty close with a Hawaiian family that I was sort of adopted into. And their whole MO was surf, fish, hunt, dive, repeat. And so that's how it was for me at a young age. I just realized I wanted to be able to surf and to be able to grow my food and to be able to live close to the land. And then that led into a lot of other things, which I'm able to do nowadays, which have like led to wealth, but in a different way. So Sam, Eddie's learning these lessons. I love what you said there, Eddie, how there's two ways to build wealth. It's either acquire more or desire less. I love that. So Sam, I'm not sure if you had the same education where pre-teen you're learning all these lessons what did your childhood look like and how did you become, you know, part of this sustainable agricultural movement? Just give us that whole background. I have a very different story. <laughs> I I mean, I went in the traditional route. I went through school. I have a bachelor's in physics from a top 10 university and about my senior year of college realized that it meant nothing. And I felt really jaded. I also had a a traumatic dr- death in the family that kind of woke me up to a lot of stories that culture tells you around what is safe, what is healthy, what is security. It was kind of awakened to some alternative paths, which took me down some interesting rabbit holes. But anyways, I eventually ended up on Maui. I was involved in the permaculture movement, got my permaculture design certification, realized that most people don't know what they're doing and wanted a mentor when I moved here and eventually met up with Eddie, went on a farm tour he was doing. He set up a lot of farms on Maui, um, these large scale agroforestry projects. And then we've been together ever since. And you just threw out the term permaculture and I've, you know, you've been talking a lot about these different farms. So I guess what is your guys's niche when it comes to farms and this type of growing that you're trying to do? And what is permaculture? I'll start off by saying, so permaculture is a term coined by some guys in Australia a few decades ago, just based off of the idea of building food systems as you would build a forest. So these self-sustaining perennial food systems, instead of having to to really take a lot from the earth and give a lot of fuel. Resources, resources use a lot of resources. Use a lot of resources to produce it. So that, But what we do isn't really that, just because... As you heard from Eddie's intro that he had a very, very alternative upbringing, pretty much decades and decades living off grid alone, very close to nature. So he he's developed this very unique system. And anyways, you go. (laughs) No, I was I was loving how you're saying that. (laughs) As Sam said, it's sort of like a movement that started to take hold, I would say, anywhere between the 70s and through right now. I want to say more middle 70s, late 70s, like you had all those homesteading movements and then the hippies kind of turned into yuppies and then some of the yuppies realized, oh, hey, we still want to have, we want to get back to the land too. And then a lot of people started making vineyards and like upscale farming operations. But then they realized like all these people were following the same sort of protocol of conventional farming, which was using chemical fertilizers and more an economical scale that they were taking from the land and not really giving back at all. So permaculture was kind of the concept from these Australian guys that was more close to homesteading where your farm is the small family farm and you feed the soil and there's different crops that your family harvests at different times and different ways to make money off of it from chicken eggs to 
someone that's farming pigs or someone that's also has a forest of trees around them that provide fruit all year round and different types of crops rather than row crops being pulled in, in and out of the ground. So it's kind of just elaborating on what Sam's saying about permaculture. For me, I've been doing this my whole life. Some of the interviews I've done, they've, I've tended to be labeled as educated by nature. The reason I'm going to go off on this rant is it goes straight into, I heard about permaculture and I'm all, what's that? Hmm. People would come to me for advice. They'd look at my farm and they'd be like, wow, you don't bring any fertilizers in. You have a closed loop system here. You're growing tons of food. Everything's giant and healthy. What are you doing? I just said, oh, I'm just copying nature and copying what the old Hawaiians did. And I hadn't even really heard about permaculture. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, permaculture started to come up. And I'm like, oh, permaculture, permaculture. They're like, oh, you're an expert at permaculture. I'm all, no, actually, I don't do permaculture. So I started going to farms that were permaculture farms and finding out that it had gotten out of the bag with no explanation. So it was almost like a way of farming that got out of the bag that the enthusiasm was getting ahead of the facts. Um, and that's a slogan I tend to throw out there again and again. Because I went to these farms that were supposedly permaculture, and all they heard was that they had to do less work. That they didn't really have to do much. They didn't have to do weeding if they laid carpet on the ground. Or that they could just grow in old tires. I'm giving you the negative side of permaculture. But I'd visit these permaculture farms and I'd be like, whoa, you can't be doing that. These tires are leaching chemicals. This carpet is petroleum. It's just going to break down into the soil. And so I found a lot of the farms I was helping people bring up to par with the systems I were built, I was building was a little bit different. So what we, we sort of center around a term called regenerative agriculture to regenerate areas that have been sort of abused or maybe how they were managed. Certain things were overlooked, perhaps, or they were unaware of it. So I'm totally new to this, and that's why we had you on, Eddie and Sam. Super excited to learn more about this. What are some of the restrictions of permaculture? Like, are there certain types of crops or certain types of foods that you can't grow in this type of environment? Or could you just talk about some of the other drawbacks? So what we do is regenerative agriculture. So this is the, the type of agriculture where you're giving more to the land than you're taking out, and you're actually able to build soil, build resources, and make a place better off than you left it. So just, just pulling back to that terminology. And there are no restrictions because it's completely based off of where you're, you're living. What we grow in Hawaii is going to be completely different than what you grow in Texas or what you grow in France. Just because there's different microclimates, there's different naturalized things that are, have been growing there. And so there's different systems already in place that thrive. So we can actually set up systems that are self-sufficient, of course, with human interaction involved in there, but it's 100% dependent on where you live. You're not going to grow bananas in Michigan. Sorry. <laughs> but you're also not going to grow carrots in some parts of Maui. So on the level of what she's saying in all the microclimates and stuff, I like to break. So you use the term and you ask the question, how does permaculture? I don't want us to get confused. We do not really do permaculture. And actually, I, I'm of this whole feeling that that movement, and even though you guys are still not even familiar with permaculture yet, because of whatever the walks of life are in different areas, some people are, there's a giant movement towards people getting back to the land, wanting to grow their food, wanting to have an understanding of where their food comes from. And I think even more so, like with this COVID-19 thing, you're seeing like seed sales went up 600%. It's crazy. All the lawn and garden stores have just been wiped out. A lot of people are stuck at home and they're like planting a seed for the first time ever in their life. And that's really cool because I think these are a pivotal time because what we need to do to make money is important in this life. But we do have to gauge that wealth against how we live and how the planet gets to live, like how the things around us are affected by the business that we do in that sense. So looking at that right now, when I say I need to differentiate it from permaculture, and say that what we do is we actually are in the mode of trying to inspire people more so than anything else. We, we make films. We do farming. On those large demo farms we do, we, uh, we sell crops. We do all the farming stuff out of it. But it's much more for a larger picture because we want to change the way farming is done. We want to make all farms and the mentality that people don't understand where their food comes from 
to me, that's really important. We've been growing food in this giant agro commercial industry for a hundred years now, 120 years, but 90% of that food is not food and it does not feed people. Most of it is actually ethanol, animal food, textiles, clothing, plastics, like a bioplastics, biofuel. A lot of people are unaware of that. And it's no longer the small family two acre farm that we as humans sort of almost evolved with into an agrarian culture. When we came from hunter or gatherer, we went into agrarian. Now we've almost seemed to left agrarian behind us in a sense and left it in the hands of giant corporations. I feel like that's a giant mistake for our future economy. Like, because it's in such a weird place and we're so removed from it, we don't have a clear understanding of what farming actually means and on how many levels it plays out. What I'm trying to get to in the differentiation between like permaculture, permaculture was put out there as a movement for years and years. And only very recently have there been a few books that have consolidated it or academicized, I don't, I don't know how to say the word properly, made put it into an academic format that it can actually be understood and interpreted as a way of farming. And so regenerative farming is right on the forefront of that as well. Patagonia just recently released an organic regenerative certification program. That's that's a big company that's going to bring that into the limelight with a lot of other large companies. So that's the tangent I'm going off on that. And that like, how do we define what permaculture is or what regenerative agriculture is and what would restrict it? Nothing what would restrict it more than just our mentality or our understanding of what farming is. So you can both feel free to answer this one if you want to. But one thing we always like to do is make sure we get some kind of tangible things that the listeners can kind of take back with them. And so if somebody is, you know, in this moment where they're wanting to start growing more of their own stuff and they're getting inspired by this episode, you know, pick out the microclimate of your choice. What is something that they could get started with that's reasonable just for, you know, one or two people who have, you know, maybe they only have a quarter acre lot or, you know, a small lot to work with. One thing that's really easy for like, let's call it a gateway drug to gardening and farming, the potato. (laughs) You can't go wrong with a potato. You can grow it in the coldest of climates and you can grow it in the warmest of climates. So from 20 degrees of the equator up, you're growing potatoes. They grow really fast. You can stick them in the ground and you're sure to get potatoes out of it with just about anything you do with them. They originally come from South America. They were taken by the, I believe, the conquistadors way back in the days, and they were brought to Europe. And then years later, the potato famine in Ireland. You, Everyone thinks the potatoes came from Ireland, but they're from South America. So, like, that's a great example of, like, how to grow a lot of food really easy and something that someone could start really easy and really quick. Another thing is uh, radishes. Radishes, will, you can go from seed to actual radish in your hand in 25 days. Lettuce and a lot of the different greens, mustard greens, kale, lettuce, a lot of these microgreen mixes have more than one green at a time in them and you can instantly be growing some stuff. So that's uh, those are some like real simple things I like to turn people on to. In this day and age, people are like, man, I can't find any seeds anywhere and they're really expensive and times are tough right now. So I tell people, well, go to the health food store and go to the organic bulk bin And you're going to find beans, fava beans, all sorts of things in there. Sesame seeds, buckwheat. Most all of those things in the organic bins will sprout and you can grow from those. So that's another kind of a cool little tip as well. So when you talk about regenerative agriculture and you said the words, I think, closed system, Eddie, what does that mean exactly? Like, I can't imagine all of these vegetables or whatever you're growing are just sprouting year after year. Like, what does closed system actually mean? Does it mean there's no waste of resources or you're reusing soil that's been decomposed by the old vegetables and things that haven't been used? Or could you just break it down at the simplest level for me? You sort of just almost broke it down right there. It's like really, (laughs) really, really simple. Think about yard waste. It's only waste because people are taking it to the dump. They're wasting Uh, it. They're wasting it. But most everything around you in environment can be recycled back into the circle and being creative with how you recycle those things into the circle, but also planting things that you want to be there so that when you do chop them, they're literally for making compost with. So we offer a course through the internet on what we do and we teach people how to what we call strategically compost. 
by how they plant a small scenario out so that everything they cut from there, they can simply put it in a bin along with their cardboard and their newspaper and all of their kitchen scraps and they can grow soil on site. We teach people how to do that in small home settings and urban settings. So not everything that we do is geared towards the large farm settings like we're on. We're trying to empower people with a relationship to their food. And sometimes that starts with as simple as a little aquarium with an aquaponic system on the top of it. That's another thing we'll tell you about if we have time. Growing things with just a fish tank with fish in it. And then on the top, the those fish have to pee and use the bathroom. And those nutrients are cycled up through plants and their roots. And plants will grow that way. So an aquarium with all the herbs in a kitchen is a great way for maybe someone to just start out and have a relationship to their food. A lot of people think, I don't have a green thumb. There's no such thing as not having a green thumb. It's all about patience, observation, and consistency. You know, these are the things that make it happen. You've locked in one of those somewhere if you think you don't have a green thumb. So I think empowering with people and letting them know that they do have a green thumb, that's pretty important. And if you've never created a garden before, you might not know that the standard way that people would create a garden is they go to the garden store and they buy soil, they buy compost, they buy fertilizer, they buy insecticide and pesticides, they're buying seeds, they're buying ground cover, they're buying like like all of these things just to build a garden. So the idea of a closed loop farm or garden is to set it up in a way that you don't ever have to bring inputs in or take things out. You don't ever have to take your yard waste to the dump to put out greenhouse gases. You can actually use that into a system. You can save your seeds. You can make your own compost. You can make your own fertilizer. You can grow plants that become fertilizer. So that's another way of saying what he just said. <laughs> yeah, and it's fun. It's like something to really geek out on at home. And I think we're hopefully we're going to get a lot more people just geeking out on that than some of the other stuff we see Looping back to what Eddie said at the beginning of the concept of you, the two ways to wealth are acquire more or desire less, something that sometimes rubs me the wrong way, especially thinking about your guys' audience, is, oh, if I desire less, I'm going to have a really crappy life. I'm going to be like this person in this tiny one-room studio with like my itchy sheets and like crappy food, and I want to invite people that like, that's not true at all. Like, I think that what we eat is literally the best food in the world. Like we go to restaurants and it's not as good as what we can make at home because I mean like lobster covered in coconut cream and like these ins just insane feasts that we're able to create. And, and it's not just cause we're on, in Hawaii, you know? You can, uh, you can go buy coconut cream in a can for $4 or $8 and you can have work to go buy that in the can. Or you could put a little work in the yard and plant a coconut tree and then you know, years later, you did some weed eating around it and you grew some other crops around it, but now you have coconuts you're harvesting off of it. And you're making your own coconut cream at home. And then the husks, you're growing more coconut trees with and you're, you're taking part in it and playing in the circle. So that's why, like, that same money, it's not like I don't have that money that I bought the coconut cream with. I actually still have that because I didn't have to go buy the coconut cream. So in a sense, like, it means like, what am I, what are the things that I really need to buy or what things can I, you know, well, make on and, site? And you gained all of the experiences and the skills and the, the joy that came out of actually learning that stuff and going through with that stuff of making the coconut yeah. cream. Well, and like Sam will say, your audience probably isn't one. They're probably looking at like, hey, and it's really funny because Sam is very much an entrepreneur and she has a very successful digital marketing company. And we, we also have a few other companies that we're dealing with. So it's kind of funny, just me, I'm like, oh, two ways to wealth, acquire more, desire less. You know, I want to see people like actually realizing, reevaluating what wealth means. Like if you're in an office your whole life and you're not living, then like, you don't want to be a slave to your wealth and you you know what I mean? Like, so where's the fine line of that? Or the, the thing you happen to see again and again in the FI community of these, these people who are working crazy, crazy hard for 20 years, nonstop, just like building up their retirement accounts to retire, but then they don't have any sense of joy or they don't even know what they like out of life. They haven't built the hobbies. They haven't built the experiences that they would actually enjoy once they retired. And they're having these crazy, like experiences where they don't even know what to do with themselves. So I don't know. There's a lot of alternatives, I guess. 
So the one thing that I'm thinking about as I listen to this is, you know, you start thinking about, well, what would hold me back? I work in an industry which has me traveling all the time. And that seems to be the one thing that always worries me when I look at getting into something is, well, I'll be home to water it. Like I've always thought about if I was going to have a house plant, it had to be a cactus. So <laughs> if, if there was somebody who was thinking about getting into this and they're kind of one foot in, one foot out, like they still do have this corporate job. Maybe they do enjoy it. Maybe they're not ready to go full blown this direction, but they want to, they want to give it a decent effort. Say they're home three days a week. Is this something that they can still participate in and see some real value out of if they're, if they're on the road a lot, if they're a traveling person? I have a definite answer for that, for sure. I traveled as a professional athlete for many years. I was all over the world. Well, I found myself in all those places I was in, finding new and different ways to go about it. But I set up systems that I knew were would take care of themselves. And it's really interesting. Everything that we've based on it, you hear about regenerative agriculture, you heard of us use that term a lot. But what I do what we do here at Living Earth Systems are these holistic systems that are closed looped, whole living systems. So they're based on a forest. You leave a forest alone, come back 40 years, if you haven't interrupted it, that forest is still super fruitful and working in perfection. That's what we seek to do, plagiarize nature and have systems that sort of take care of themselves. So yeah, for the person who has an apartment and he's not quite in the forest, I think there's little things you can do a window container garden, an aquarium in the kitchen, maybe even a couple beds in your yard to set them up with a drip system and a timer. I think there's key ways you can automate a lot of systems where you could be gone from any one of these systems for two weeks at a time, no problem, as long as you followed the key rules of the patients and the consistency and the observations to know what you have for it. You were, you were trying to say something. Also with that, is it sounds like a great time to actually connect in with your family or your community. Because there's, maybe you live alone, and there's plenty of people who live alone, but plenty of people have roommates, plenty of people have wives or kids, plenty of people have neighbors, where you can actually use it as an excuse to build community and build these experiences that we can have with the people around us. So suddenly we're not this like lonely island in the sea of urban setting. So you can subscribe to a community garden. You can just support a local farmer that's doing it right. Just spend your money there. Well, oh, that's a key one that yeah. you're bringing up. If I could go off on a quick little tangent on that. Absolutely. Okay, earlier in the podcast, you guys asked about what's regenerative agriculture, what's permaculture. But I think what we need to ask is what is agriculture for you personally, the bulk of your audience, maybe. I don't know who who is the audience. Everybody out there, hello. <laughs> um, but I, I think you all have to ask yourselves, what is agriculture to you? Is it the cheapest vegetables in the store? Well, then that's probably commercial agriculture, the big giant rows you see everywhere. You probably don't even see it because most of the agriculture around you is probably taken up with soybean and corn. And none of that's actually going to the store around you. That's going to big silos and to other production. So you have to ask yourself, if I support a local farmer in my neighborhood, what am I supporting? Well, if you're supporting a, an agro company in your neighborhood that's doing it the wrong way, they're not, and I do t take that stance, if they're not taking care of the land, if they're not composting, if they're not doing things in a fashion that takes care of their environment, then those aren't the farmers you should support. You want to find the farmers in your area. And I guarantee you, no matter where you're at in the world right now, they're just down the road because there's a giant movement right now. And not just permaculture and, uh, and regenerative farming, but people wanting to be able to play a part in their food and community. And so I think if you look and you reach out, you're going to find that there's a farm in your neighborhood somewhere or close to you somewhere that's trying to make a difference, whether it's in an inner city or you're urban. And try to support those people that really have that emphasis on giving back to the land that they take from. If not, you're it's stuck in that whole corporate agricultural system that everybody's been buying into for so long that most of the food on your table is coming from third world countries and slave labor and gnarly chemicals, unless you really know where it is coming from. Well, and especially in a time like this where, I mean, we're in a very unique time in history with a global pandemic. Like we haven't seen this before in our lifetimes and we don't know when this would happen again. So it's waking a lot of people up as to the flaws in the system. <laughs> and it's also showing where resilience lies. 
And resilience lies within yourself and it resilience lies in the relationships that you have with other humans and with nature, but with other humans. So right now it's such a great excuse. Use this time to learn, meet your neighbors. I mean, I mean, social distancing, of course, but I mean, <laughs> support your local farmer and get to know the businesses in your area because we don't know what the future is going to bring. But if you know your community and you there's strength there. The current environment, the pandemic, everyone is worrying. And so this is a crazy scenario, but in the scenario where you just want to go completely off grid, like Justin was talking about, some people might be one foot in, one foot out. But if you want to go completely off grid, let's use a family of four, for example, either of you guys can tackle this question. How much land or space do you reasonably need to grow a sustainable amount of food where you won't need to get your food from anywhere else? Not much. <laughs> so it all depends how committed you are to that ideal and also what your diet is because some vegetarians could do it as simple as a couple of ponds eating algae <laughs> living on spirulina shakes pretty much have everything they need right in there so you say edible or eatable <laughs> some people are vegetarian some people eat fish some people eat chicken some people don't but on one acre of land literally on a quarter acre of land it, it's like how extreme do you want to get in urban settings you can take an eighth of an acre of land. You can do vertical hydroponics and you can grow tonnage of food on a quarter acre with the right savvy on an eighth of an acre on a parking lot. So it's like, it's hard to say on a, and most of the areas that I found, I can take 3000 foot square lot, which is smaller than most people's yard around their house and produce at least 40 to 50% of my food just from that supplement all my vegetables from a very small area. I've also been in settings where I've been in the city working on a project and we've taken an area that's no bigger than 12 foot by 12 foot and eight feet tall. And we've grown probably, we've grown, if we were vegetarians, we would have grown all of our food there, but you can only eat so many tomatoes and so many lettuce and so many cucumbers if you're not a vegetarian. You know what I mean? So like we wound up providing all of that that we needed for ourselves and for a lot of neighbors around us as well. We've had a setting where we've grown one plant, one broccoli cauliflower tree that fed 16 people a handful of greens every single day for a year. That plant is still growing in Southern California, feeding a family on that farm. Uh, so it's like how you approach it. We live in a day and age where technology is amazing. And if we can get that understanding of blending technology and nature and putting them together, we're pretty much unstoppable. If you see how much food they grow on the space shuttle, on the space station, that should give us a little idea of like what we're able to do nowadays. But also in there, you would have to ask, if, ask yourself a few questions. Like, do you want to learn how to hunt? Do you have fishing in your area? Like, because those are amazing resources for healthy food. Do I want to raise animals? Do I feel ethically sound killing the animals that I raise? Am I fine doing vegetarian? Because then I can just have chicken eggs. And it's amazing how many eggs you can get out of chickens if you have a few of them. I'm going to go through, if, if this is all right timing wise, I'm going to go through and give, give you a little list and tell you how we eat. So like for, for us, if you want to look at what we have in our arsenal, if we were to go step out into the front yard, the, the greens that we could eat. Some of them you'll know the name of, some of them you won't. Tahitian taro, katuk, mustard greens, collard greens. Arugula. Arugula, go to cola. Taro greens. Taro greens, moringa, the ginger shoot greens, peyote squash green, kabocha squash green, sweet potato tops. Like I'll just, it'll, then this will, that'll just keep going too long as far as greens go. So I can just walk out there and there's so much food, it's just ridiculous. But then, then there's pumpkins, there's sweet potatoes, there's tomatoes, there's egg avocados, eggplants, papayas. Mango. Mango, breadfruit, taro, that list, just from a little short stint of it vegetables wise. And then for animals in the river, there's Tahitian prawn, which is a giant shrimp that's delicious. There's wild boar and there's wild axis deer. The axis deer and the boar are both out of control and they don't have anything to control them, a lion in the setting. So we actually have to do a certain amount of control to protect our crops from them. So that's bacon and smoked deer meat and it's one of the like best deer meats on the planet. 
there's a spring on our property. So the spring water goes into a filter and that's our spring water. If we sent you some pictures of what our meals look like every night, you would think we were like the finest five-star restaurant you've ever been in all the time. Like the last smoked meal we made, we the salt came from the ocean. The sugar came from sugar cane that we grow and we dehydrated it, made it into cane juice and dehydrated it into sugar. And then chili pepper and like wild boar out of the valley stuck in a smoker and smoked with the trees we cut from right here. So we're able to do these large farm to table dinners as well. That's what part of what our farm is based on is we educate people and we bring them in and we do farm to table dinners and we share with them this bounty so that they can see what's available around them. So it, it's not just because it's Hawaii. Like we, when we were in Southern California, we were getting free range cow from our neighbors. We had all of our vegetables we were growing ourselves. We had tilapia that we were growing in an aquaponic system. We were in a very small area. So we were also supporting local farms for local grain and beans. But then there's other examples in like the Midwest and all over the US of people who like, you can eat 100% local if you're committed to it. The question is, is that fun for you? And we don't just eat local either. Like I, we're not crazy people, right. <laughs> but I can, we can. I can interject on that too. So like, as I was traveling for years, Indonesia or wherever I was, sometimes you'll get the Indo belly and you gotta be careful for what you eat. So I used to have a little slogan. When I travel, I'd live on haagen and Snickers bars. People look at my life in Hawaii and they'd be like, oh my God, look at you, you're in impeccable shape. You're surfing the best waves in the world. Oh, man, you're eating the best food and drinking the best water right there at your fingertips. How could you possibly eat a haagen Like, get over it, man. We got to like, we have, you don't want to be extreme on a level. You have to live life. And so like, I felt like I can eat a haagen or a Snickers because I am living such a healthy lifestyle. So it kind of led into that where I was, where I'm able to do that in that sense. The whole point of this is to empower yourself to not be dependent on things that you don't have to or want to be dependent right. on. But the Fallbrook project, mm -hmm. back to your original question as well. When I, when you ask like, what kind of food, how limited are you by your space? There's a case study on our website. You guys can point to that later. People could check out if they want. We went to California and we went on an eighth of an acre of land and we took a parking lot and we turned this parking lot into a paradise. We took a parking lot that in California is known as decomposed granite. We added earthworms and we chipped all the trees on the area that was around the yard and we put them on top of it along with earthworms. That's all we brought in. And then we took the swimming pool that was there and we retrofitted it and turned it into an aquaponic system with fish in it that people still swam in. And then we were able to fertilize the entire property out of the swimming pool and on that property, we grew several tons of vegetables. There's still vegetables growing there to this day. And where they thought there was nothing able to be grown there at all, we actually did it all with the compost from the people who were eating in the, on the household. I think there was 11 people living on this property because there was four houses on it. So we simply took the paper byproducts, the cardboard, the food scraps, and then along with the water that we exchanged from the swimming pool, from the fish and the plants that we were growing up there, the byproduct of that, we fertilized this parking lot and turned it into this major food production. Just like absolutely amazing in a tiny little urban setting in Southern California. So I actually grew up in an area where a lot of my family hunted. We got a lot of our food from the land. My granddad was a full-time farmer. So these like ideas aren't extremely distant for me, but yet like, I don't really practice them myself because you know you get busy, life goes on, you get disconnected from it and you just kind of need to be brought back into it or you need educated maybe for some people for the first time. And so as I was thinking about that, I thought about this uh, this orphanage I work with sometimes in Mexico and they have this cool setup where People who are going to Mexico anyway on a vacation, you know, they can jump off the cruise ship and instead of going snorkeling, they can do these excursions to the orphanage and learn about it and get that education, get that exposure. But they went there, you know, on a vacation. I assume that y'all have something like that. You kind of alluded to it, but I was curious if you could break it down. Like if somebody wanted to come to Maui, they're already going there for a vacation, but they want to do something that's going to better themselves and they want to get there and see it firsthand and learn. What does that look like for people? Okay, so we have a few things set up here on Maui. We run a, a nonprofit, and our nonprofit is Regenerative Education Centers. And that is a place that we can conduct 
practices that we're able to make open to the public, like worm composting, showing people how to use earthworms to compost their food scraps. Or we also do films out of there as well, but teaching people that like 100 million disposable coffee cups a day. So bring your own coffee cup if you're going to go to the coffee store. You know what I mean? These little things. We run the nonprofit off a 170-acre farm here on the north shore of Maui. On this farm, we also run our main business, which is Living Earth Systems. That's where we do a lot of outreach. And we run another project in the back of this as well. But we we bring people in and we have we do farm-to-table tours, farm-to-table dinners, we do daytime walking tours, as well as longer half-day hiking excursions. This valley that we're in, it's called Maliko Gulch. It's on the North Shore of Maui, and it's been polluted for over a century. It's been used as a dump, but it's in this most beautiful area. So we've taken it on to clean it up, clean up the river, regenerate the environment, and now we're planting out an agroforest strategy to show the world. Basically, to show the larger agroforestry strategies on Maui that have shut down and went out of operation, and they're just sitting fallow those fields right now, they just want to bring in more bad agriculture, we're trying to set up an example to show those guys what solid agroforestry looks like, and that's based on all of the Polynesian voyaging plants that were brought by the Hawaiians to grow here. And that's where my culture, where my expertise in this and setting up these systems comes in, So we're in the process of cleaning up this valley, setting up these tours, and we have an education center up and running. They can find us on Airbnb. We do some tours through there, as well as several different things, and we do workshops and a lot of other things. Intern program? Yeah, we also have an intern program that's available on our website where we bring people in and people can live with us for six months. And they can actually go through the everyday program. Some of those people get paid and work at the same time. Some of those people are fine. Some people pay us to be able to actually get our method under their belt. And they just want to come and shadow us and learn what we're doing and how to do it. So, yeah, there's a, we, have, we do a lot of these different things here on Maui, and that's based on the North Shore. Well, Eddie and Sam, thank you both so much for coming on the show. I know you've already given us a few different ways that people can interact with you. But if there's one good place for people to follow along with this story or to contact you, where would that one place be? Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I think she says Instagram because we post really consistently on Instagram and it's 100% our own material. We don't copy and paste from anywhere. So if you look on that, you can kind of get a daily view into what's going on with us. We have three, four different Instagram accounts that we spread it across. Some of them are my surf action that we do in the ocean. Some of them are about farming. One of them is the nonprofit. And another one is specific to the Maliko project. Well, you guys definitely have a ton going on. I'm sure we'll link to all of that stuff in the show notes. We're going to link to Living Earth Systems. We're going to try to find all that surfer stuff and all that styrofoam eating worms you're talking about. Super cool stuff, Eddie. Don't worry, listeners. You will not have to remember all those different handles and all those different websites. But so I'll have both you guys answer this question separately. We always ask all of our guests, If you had one piece of advice for anyone on the path to financial independence, what would that piece of advice be? My advice for getting started on your path for financial independence is to really get clear on what fulfills you and what makes you happy, because that's ultimately what getting security through finances is really like, that's the whole reason you're doing it. That's the whole reason you're retiring. So making sure that you know that early on in the process and incorporating that into your daily or at least weekly life so that you're not 100% disconnected to that through your entire process is going to lead to a more fulfilling life and also make it easier once you actually hit financial independence. I would say number one tip for folks on the path to financial independence is do not be afraid to spend to make. Money is a tool, just like a screwdriver or a hammer. I'm not going to use a rock to screw this in. Sometimes if I need to make something, I want to have the confidence if I see something and I know it's solid to take it on and to be able to spin it to my ability to create something with it. That's a different example for everybody, but I think that a lot of people... They look at money and they think that the best thing to do with it is to hold on to it. 
but I found that to try to hold on to too much of it and not to let it flow or make it work for you will make it stagnant. And it's sort of like my same philosophy in the garden. You have to keep things moving and flowing and growing or they won't. So you've been great sports through all of this and we've almost got you through the podcast, but we do have one last question. And that is a question that I didn't prepare for. Cody didn't prepare for. You heard us talking back and forth where we weren't even sure who was going to ask you the question. This is the wild card question. You guys ready? Oh, yeah. Okay, Eddie. So I've got to ask, as somebody who spent so much time outdoors in the wild, I was hoping you could give me just one kind of interesting animal encounter in the wild. Huh, an animal encounter in the wild. I could probably give you quite a few of them. So I'm out surfing. I'm in about three, four feet of water, perfect waves, barreling. All of a sudden I see a giant tiger shark doing about 30 mile an hour straight for me in about three feet of water. And I'm about ready to either go in on the wave or I don't even know what to do. So I just sort of catch the white water when I see it right, like almost on top of me. It turns at the last second. And I turn around and there's this big fat fish floating behind me. It had attacked the fish and the fish got out of its mouth and was like still on the surface. So I turned around and grabbed the fish real quick and I skittled in the shore. And there just happened to be a film crew there for a big swell had come in. It was this big swell we were surfing and they were on the beach for some reason or another. And they filmed me with the fish with the teeth marks in it. And it's a fish that you normally can't take out of that area fishing because it's a protected area. But since the circumstances, they let me take it home and eat it. And I think I, I put that later on on my Instagram. One of my lovely deals, I called it surf and surf. <laughs> surf and surf. <laughs> That's a great story. Well, Eddie and Sam, this has been so much fun. I was really excited when you guys sent us an email and told us about the things you're doing, the regenerative agriculture and the aquaponics and everything to do with agriculture and sustainability. Super exciting stuff. We've never had a guest like you guys on before so thank you guys so much for spending time with us today and sharing all these little nuggets of information thanks you guys this has been really really fun really appreciate you guys hospitality and your great questions and thank you so much it's been a pleasure to be here to be able to speak with all your audience out there and i tell everyone aloha from maui and if you're ever here come say hi Man, Cody, I thought this was a really cool episode, definitely a unique one. You know, I'm thinking back to episodes we had with like card counting and, you know, those kind of episodes where this is something that people aren't used to hearing, but it's still really relevant and a really cool episode. What do you think? Yeah, one of the most interesting things, I think, was the parallels that you can draw between this regenerative agriculture or just sustainability in general and the FI community. Eddie was talking about how the two ways to build wealth is to acquire more or desire less. And it's the same thing with farming. Like he's giving back to the land. He's always kind of using the crops and the agriculture in a cycle. And that's kind of the same thing we do with our money in the FI community. It's like spend less than you earn so you can invest that money and let the money kind of work in a cycle for you where it's gaining interest and then you can spend it on the things you value. And I liked a lot of those parallels that he drew. And also Sam, on the other hand, came from a completely different background than Eddie. She came from academics and then kind of realized her identity and her purpose was not there. She got into this regenerative agriculture, met Eddie, and she was pretty instrumental in drawing a lot of those parallels in this podcast episode. So I think it's something that a lot of people in this audience, like we mentioned before, it's something totally different than we've ever had before. But I think a lot of people are going to resonate with this one. A thing that jumped out to me with the episode is when you're looking at financial independence, I'm always thinking about kind of the insurance, and I don't mean technically insurance, but like things that we can do so that we feel safer about it when we do retire. Some of those things are making our spending lower. Some of those things are like owning our own home. So no matter what, we know we got a place to live. And I thought this fell right in there where no matter what happens outside of your control, if you can handle your own food source, that really just makes you bulletproof when you're going into financial independence. Being able to control like a large cost factor that people have and also one that's obviously a necessity. We all have to eat. So if you just put that in the bucket of like, hey, I can really draw my spending down. Maybe you own your own home or you've got like a really stable living environment. And then you can also grow your own food. No matter what goes on outside of that, you're probably going to be able to stay retired and be just a lot more comfortable with the idea of walking away from work. And actually another cool parallel now that I'm thinking about it between this and FI is it's a spectrum. It's not just like you have to go all in or you don't have to do it at all. Eddie was saying that 
yeah, if you're living in New York City and you're not a vegetarian, it's probably going to be pretty hard to, you know, raise your own cattle or hunt for deer. It's just not possible. Or maybe it's possible. It's very, very difficult. So he's saying you can do this thing as a spectrum. Like you could get 50% of your crops or of your food from this regenerative agriculture from your own garden. You could get 20%. You could get 80%. You could get 100%. There's so many ways you can do this. But no matter how much of a percent, how much you dip your toes into this, it's going to be a net positive for you. And that project he was talking about in California was completely mind boggling to me. Like I'm kicking myself. I don't really have any crops going right now. And I definitely should. And it's something I'm going to start looking into. Maybe one of those fish tank hydroponic systems. He was producing multiple tonnages of vegetables from an eighth of an acre plot in California. Like that's just crazy to me. I'd always think that, yeah, I need acres and acres to provide for, you know, me and my family and have this big old garden where I'm going to be, you know, weeding every day. And it's going to be this huge project. But Eddie made it just seem so much more tangible and so much more attainable for the average person to incorporate this into their life. Yeah, Cody, and along that same thread, you know, when we think about financial independence and somebody's kind of just getting started, we're always just like, hey, pick one thing that you can control, one line item, reduce that, and then go into the next one. Don't overwhelm yourself. And that's another thing that we got from this episode. And Eddie was talking about how things like potatoes and radishes, no matter what your environment you're in, what your skill set is, like anyone can grow a potato. So I really like that idea of having something simple that you can get started with. And one last thing that I really liked about this episode and some things that they highlighted that we can do even if we don't want to get into this regenerative agriculture, even if we don't want to grow our own crops at all, is just supporting these local businesses. And I realize it's a lot more than I'd like to admit, but a lot of the food I'm eating is from these huge corporations just because it's cheap at the grocery store. And I know that there's a lot of farmers, there's a lot of people doing the right stuff, the right stuff meaning being sustainable, using a closed loop system, not using a crazy ton of pesticides and fertilizers and things like that. So that really expanded my mindset. And now I've been a lot more conscious about the things I'm buying, where they came from and go out there and support local. Even if you don't want to get into this regenerative agriculture and grow your own stuff, like I mentioned, you can still help out the environment, make an impact, be a sustainable person by going out and supporting the local farmers. And now it's time for the call to action. And the call to action this week goes right along with that. So Try to implement one of these simple systems in your own life, whether it's growing potatoes or one of these fish tank type systems where you could grow some simple herbs for cooking at home. And if you can't do one of those things, you're not comfortable with it, maybe take some time out to do some investigation to figure out where your food's coming from and if there is a way for you to support local farmers and gardeners. And if you enjoyed this episode, you want to dig into the show notes, get some of the details we talked about, you can check out their multiple Instagram accounts and everything that Eddie and Sam are doing. And you can do that over at thefyshow.com slash farm. That's thefyshow.com slash farm. And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening.